celebrate with us and to join in acknowledging and remembering the legacy of Dr. Sonia Hayes Stone. Tonight, we're going to have a very, very special evening with a very, very special guest. I don't have to say much more than that, but um, to tell the truth, in, in many cases, the joy for us is being able to bring you all together and having the kind of conversations that this institution is known for and that the Stone Center is known for. Uh, I'm not going to do very much in the beginning. Uh, we had given you, I do want to mention that we had given you cards to write questions on, but um, uh, our speaker has asked that she hear your own voice, so we're going to move back and allow you to ask questions directly. Uh, so that wasn't my idea. Uh, uh, we are very, very happy to uh, indulge our guests because she's done this on many, many occasions. Some of you have seen her before, and I know that you will enjoy her again tonight as she speaks about some of her newer works. Um, I've been asked to, to mention up front, because I have a tendency to forget once we get into the program, that the Stone Center's uh, Film Festival opened next week, and many of you have been the guests of the Film Festival for many years. So on Thursday, uh, the 28th, uh, at 7 p.m., uh, our film festival will kick off here with Joan and one other film. I also want to mention that this year we have two other community partners where we will be screening films. One, of course, is the Haiti Heritage Center uh, in Durham. So for those of you who may not be able to make it all the way over to Chapel Hill, we'll be screening there. And we have two guests in the audience, uh, Angela Carter and Leon Carter, who are here from Ngozi Design and we'll be doing really nice film screenings and discussions at their shop right there on uh, West Main Street, exactly. Um, I want to ask you to follow the order of the program, and I'm going to, of course, uh, try to move us along and keep us on track. Uh, I know that uh, many of you rush to get over here, and we want to make sure that you have a full opportunity to engage with our host, probably with our guests. So without further ado, I'd like to bring up uh, Chancellor Folt. Many of you know that uh, since Chancellor Folt has been here at the university, she has been the welcoming voice for each Stone lecture that's taken place. And I think that's a remarkable, remarkable statement. Of her. that he said that because I was noticing that this is the 25th annual Sonia Haynes Stone Memorial Lecture and my very first was the 20th. And I am thinking, boy, <laughs> is that how many years have gone by? Uh, but it is true that every single one of these lectures has been a memorable occasion. It has been, for me, a place that has sort of bound me to this place, is to come to these beautiful lectures and hear people speak about what this special place means and all the different uh, aspects that we've discussed in these lectures. So I am just honored and privileged to be able to be here to welcome yet another Stone Lecture on the occasion of the 25th birthday. So I want to start with a few thank yous, especially to the members of the Stone Center Advisory Board. And are any of you here tonight? And if you are, could you raise your hands? and? We can thank you. I think I'm seeing quite a few people. They're not raising them very high. But there are a lot of people here shyly sitting in the Thank you. Also, how many students are here? Welcome. Love to have all the students here. Thank you for being here. How many faculty and staff from wonderful? Thank you. Community are here tonight. See, that's the special. One of the things that's most special about this university, but I also think this particular lecture, is that every time I ask that question, I see a pretty even distribution across members from the students, faculty, staff, and community, and it really is exactly what this center dreamt from the start it would become. And I know it's what matters so much to the people that work here and try to really see it be a reality. And 
know we have so many co-sponsors, co just for the sake of time, I won't read my entire set of cards thanking everybody, but this is a lecture that's sponsored by many people from across campus, and it's something very, very special for us. And tonight, in for a particularly wonderful treat, hearing from a truly gifted and insightful author. And if we're hearing from her, as we're all working as a community to adapt to a changing landscape. And it's always changing, but we are in the midst of great change in our society, at our university. It's something that is the hallmark of our days. And I think no one would disagree if I said it was a bit of a chaotic world. Um, I do think that's part of the normal state of things, but chaos can have good effects on change, but it can also be quite uh, damaging. And so we're, we're trying to have a university that can hold sacred the open space of democracy while still sticking to its ideals and principles at a time when information is more accessible than ever before. It hits us at a quicker pace, but lies are often spread much more rapidly. It's a time when facts are presented and then the next day they can change. And I think it's a time when stereotyping is used to simplify in ways that bear little resemblance to the people they're really discussing. And that this was very uh, clear to me when I met and worked with the students when they were reading Mustafa Bayoumi's uh, book that we read in the first years. What does, how, what does, how does it feel to be a problem? It was all about stereotyping of Arabic Americans after 9-11. And in his lecture, he said that he believed that stereotypes live in abstraction. And I think that was such an insightful statement that we're able to abstract things and then we can believe the stereotype. But what is the most potent and important way to eliminate abstractions and stereotypes? It's the job of the storyteller. And we're going to be hearing today from someone who is one of the most beautiful storytellers living today and telling stories that people need to hear that help us get past abstraction and get right to the heart of what is really important. The stories Edwidge Danikat tells grapple with some of the most universal yet personal threads of our lives. And they can only be understood through the storyteller, the story of real lives. She talks about things like the unbreakable yet intensely fragile bonds of family and nationality, and the un unavoidable yet inherently unknowable experience of death through the stories that she tells. You know, facts matter. I spend a lot of time as a scientist dealing with facts, as a chancellor trying to find evidence and, and facts. But at the end of the day, I think that our humanity is shaped by the stories like the ones that we're going to hear today from Ms. Danticat. The stories that really matter, the stories of real people who are the humanity that we all seek to advance and be a part of. And they, I think we're just going to be so excited to hear her that I just want to say I'm excited to be with you because part of the beauty of a storyteller is being part of the audience that is the receiver of that story and the incredible bond that you build between the person telling the story and how you're hearing it. So we're all part of that experience tonight. Sure, her presence here is also a very fitting tribute to another UNC icon, and that's Dr. Sonia Haynes Stone, who played an unparalleled role at UNC as a scholar and a teacher and an advocate, and you're going to hear more about her in just a moment. I am very honored, as I said, to have been a part of each Stone lecture during my time here, and I want to thank you all for being a part of this experience tonight. And I'm going to turn it over in a moment to Angam Check, a Stone Center Douglas Fellow, who will talk more about the life and legacy of Dr. Sonia Haynes Stone. But I have one last thing I want to share. And it's a quote that comes from Ms. Danticat. And she said, I hope to be a good role model for my daughters. Now, as a mother of a daughter, that actually meant a lot to me. That's a pretty big aspiration. But what I want to say to her 
is not only is she going to be a role model for her daughters, she's a role model for all of us and our children and our children's children. So uh, please join me now in welcoming Andrew Chapman. Hi, good evening, everybody. Dr. Sonia Haynes Stone, triumphant life raised this earth from 1938 to 1991. She came to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 1974. She was a native of Chicago and earned a bachelor's degree in social science from Sarah Lawrence College, a master's in social work from Atlanta University, and she earned a philosophy degree from the University of Illinois at Chicago. She also earned her doctorate in history and the philosophy of education from Northwestern University. In 1981, she received a Woman of the Year Award from the NAACP and in 1990, she received a faculty award from the class of 1990. She was also the first recipient of the Outstanding Black Faculty Award from the University General Alumni Association in 1990. After her ultimate death in 1991, the Stone Center Planning Committee and hundreds of students, faculty, staff, and community members like us out here in the audience guarded to get the, board, the University Board of Trustees approval to name the center after her. While at UNC Chapel Hill, she served as Director of Curriculum in African American Studies, a post, a post she held until 1979. She founded the Black Press Institute at North Carolina Central University in 1977 and served as Director until 1979. Throughout her tenure at the university, Dr. Stone served as a mentor, a teacher. She served as a social activist and a friend for students and faculty alike. She emphasized students to her and her colleagues the importance of excellence in scholarship and the idea that public service and advocacy and the idea that public service and advocacy for social justice are not impositions on academic life, but are instead imperatives we accept when we enter the, these halls. As the 2017-2018 Sean Douglas Fellow here at the Stone Center, I am honored to be one of the many students, staff, faculty, and community members that have accepted this, the challenge Dr. Stone presents to us with the hope that we may in some small way honor her enduring legacy. Thank you. singular and collective. I recall Sally Ann throwing herself off an unstable skiff and taking her stillborn daughter Suisse with her as they, quote, go to meet Agwe under the sea, end of quote, in Danticat's first short story collection, Krika. The spirit of Amabel from The Farming of Bones lingers in my mind as her story becomes a monument because there are no plaques for the 20,000 Haitians and dark-skinned Dominicans murdered by Dominican forces at the border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic on the island of Hispaniola. I will never forget my first trip to Haiti with my friend April Shanak. As our plane landed and we saw Haiti for the first time, in unison we said, behind those mountains are more mountains, which is how the country is described in Children of the Sea, another short story by Ed Beach Danticat. Dantica is an author, activist, mother, and so much more. In her wide-ranging body of work, op-eds, children's books, novels, memoirs, essays, edited collections, and congressional testimony, Dantica demonstrates her ability to show us what's behind each mountain. In every genre, she crafts complex narratives that undermine romanticism while cultivating empathy. Dantica makes me laugh, cry, and feel the power of her words. Her storied career includes six books for children, for children and young adults, three edited volumes, and numerous recognitions and awards, including a MacArthur Genius Grant. Her first novel, Breath, Eyes, Memory, 
was in Bumper Book Club selection. The Farming of Bones was recognized with an American Book Award. In 2007, Doc Pot testified before Congress on immigration detainees and medical care. Dante Pott's 81-year-old uncle, Joseph Nusayas Dantaka, who was seeking temporary asylum from armed gangs terrorizing his community, was despite visiting the U.S. regularly for more than 30 years, taken to the Crone Detention Center in Miami. There, he was denied his medications and thought to be faking illness. He was later, later taken to a prison hospital, where he received no treatment for more than 24 hours and died a short time later. In her testimony, Dr. Katz speaks of the criminalization of asylum seekers and the undermining of internationally recognized human rights laws and practices. Her memoir, Brother, I Am Dying, based on her uncle's story, won the National Book Critics Circle Award and the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. Her most recent work, The Art of Death, Writing the Final Story, was published this summer. Through her work, we learned that the paradise of the Caribbean or the Pearl of the Antilles, as Haiti was known when it was a colony, plundered by France, England, and later the United States, is a nation that remains a beacon of black freedom across the world. Today, Haiti is often a pitied country. However, Dante Katz's work repeatedly and relentlessly takes us to the heart of Haiti and its people. She guides us through their various contradictions, complexities, and the beauty of their lives. She allows us to see their joy and their humanity. Beyond her fiction, her human rights work has been a much needed intervention in discourses of humanitarianism outside of Haiti and citizenship and belonging on the island of Hispaniola. In my Spitting in the Wind class, we read her collection of essays, Create Dangerously. In the opening essay of that collection, Dr. Katt tells us that she, quote, creates dangerously for people who read dangerously. Writing, knowing that in part, no matter how trivial your words may seem, someday, somewhere, someone may risk his or her life to read them. End of quote. The final project for this course asks students to engage in a dialogue on a topic that they are passionate about, and when and where possible, with an audience who don't already agree with them. In this process, students always return to Nantaka to justify their rationales for their projects. They universally talk about creating dangerously, or trying to, for those who can read dangerously. <coughs> when a demagogue such as Francois Papadac de Valier, whose power was built on terrorizing a nation, a people read it dangerously and needed artists who created it dangerously. Dante Cat helps us hear stories like that of Alerte Berlance, whose tongue was cut out, body beaten, and left for dead by the Tantan Lukut. The Dewbreaker, a collection of linked short stories, deals with the consequences of a daughter, Ka, finding out that her father was a torturer for the Duvalier regime. Interwoven in this family's crisis are stories of the many lives destroyed and diminished because of what this torturer did. Dante Pat does, does not allow the moving family drama to stand alone. Characters impacted by state violence remind readers of the consequences. While unable to feel sorry for Ka's father, the book is not about his redemption, but about how we as readers are both implicated in state violence and the ways we seek justice while we have the privilege to quote unquote go about our normal lives. In 2011, feminist journalist Matt McClellan used the story of a Haitian woman's gang rape to speak of her own trauma and relationship to violence. While many white feminists in the US applauded McClelland, Haitian women illustrated how McClelland's actions, which included live tweeting when the woman she called Kay encountered her attackers, violated and endangered this Haitian survivor. Several activists, that cut among them, used their platform to share Kay's words. In Essence magazine, Dante Cat quotes Kay saying, quote, I want the victims in Haiti to know that they can be strong and stand up for their rights and have a voice. Our choices about when and how our story is told must be respected." End of quote. This story not only illustrates the intersections of race, gender, class, and imperialism, but it also demonstrates Dante Pat's deep respect for people 
and their stories. Her attention to location and history helps us navigate our own good intentions. In her work, but particularly the essays in Create Dangerously, Dance Pat explores the relationship between an immigrant artist, her birth country, and her immigrant home, as well as how art illuminates history and what we can learn from injustice and catastrophe. As Jamaican writer Louise Bennett said in her prologue of the, women, the woman writer in Caribbean society, quote, in the Caribbean, where the word continues to be flesh, the future of women, men, and the society we are all shaping can benefit from the words of a number of us. A number of us have spoken, written, and are uttering, and still writing." End of quote. Bennett's words capture all that Dante Pat does because she, she makes the word flesh and makes us feel. Please join me in welcoming at least Dante Pat. Good evening. Thank you so much, Professor Shields, for that extraordinary introduction. I always feel like I don't have to speak anymore. <laughs> um, I want to start by saying to you, oh, ne. Is there Are there any Haitians or Haitians? Oh, ne. Respect. Um, so one way that we greet each other is sometimes by saying, oh, ne. And then the, the greeter says, oh, ne. And the person receiving the greeting says, uh, respect. It's not quick crack, which is also called in response, but um, for storytelling. So the novelist in me would be saying quick, and you would say crack. Uh, but the essayist and this other person, um, and Mita is saying one. Respect. So I want to say honor and respect for these past 25 years at the Stone Center, since uh, this is the daunting 25th anniversary lecture, and honor and respect to Dr. Sonia Haynes Stone, whose activism and mentorship honors our presence tonight. Incidentally, she is my soror via Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. Excuse <laughs> <laughs> <Skip> me. <laughs> um, honor and respect for all the struggle it took for the center to even exist for those who came before us to insist on its right to be here and who continue to fight for its right to be here. I have been lost in the center these past few weeks attending your past lectures via the internet <laughs> and a feeling of growing sense of intimidation at your extraordinary list of uh, previous speakers in this lecture series. Uh, thank you for folding me into this wonderful tradition and thank you all for coming out tonight on what feels like a very warm Miami, might be one of your last ones, so I'm so happy you're spending it um, with me. And thank you to Professor Jordan and to Madame Chancellor, and again to Professor Shields for that wonderful introduction. I also want to, you to keep close in your mind our brothers and sisters who are suffering right now from recent natural disasters, first from Hurricane Harvey, then Irma, and then Jose, now Maria, which has been devastated so many already <coughs> devastated places in the Caribbean, and also our brothers and sisters in Mexico City uh, who have endured two terrible earthquakes in these past few weeks. Courage to them, and if you can do anything to help, please do. We have been there as Haitians in that situation, as Caribbeans too, and um, it counts a lot what people can do. So my talk is entitled, A Right to Be Here, James Baldwin and My Third Culture Kids. I tried to imagine this talk possibly as a conversation Dr. Stone and I might have if we were to have met. The words I'm about to share with you are part of an ongoing exploration for me, something I keep trying to write about in different ways, about how our issues and struggles in the African diaspora are bound in both our moments of jubilee, but especially in our moments of pain, no matter how we happen to say une and answer respect. So here it is. In the summer of 2015, soon after the one-year anniversary of the fatal shooting of the teenager Michael Brown, 
by Ferguson Mercer, Missouri Police Officer Darren Wilson. I was in Haiti on the southernmost border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic where hundreds of Haitian refugees had either been deported or had been driven out of the Dominican Republic by intimidation or threats. Many of these men and women and children had very little warning that they were going to be picked up or chased away, and most of them had fled with nothing but the clothes on their backs. It was a bright, sunny day on the border town of Ansapit, but the air was so thick with dust that as some friends and I walked through the makeshift resettlement camps on the Haitian side of the border, a place called Pacado. At Pacado, it felt as though we, along with the residents of the camps, were floating through clouds, clouds of desperation and hopelessness. Around us were lean-tos made of cardboard boxes and sheets. Dust-covered dust -covered children walked around looking dazed, even while playing with pebbles that stood in for marbles. Elderly people stood on the edge of food and clothes distribution lines, some too weak to wade into the crowd. Later, the elderly, along with pregnant women and the disabled, will be given special consideration by the priests and nuns who were giving out the only food available to the camp dwellers. But the food would always run out before they could get to everyone who needed it. A few days after leaving Haiti and returning to the United States, I read a Michael Brown anniversary opinion piece, an op-ed in the Washington Post. It was written by Raha Horjani, an immigration attorney and law professor. In her essay, Horjani argues that African Americans living in the United States could qualify as refugees. Citing many then recent cases of police brutality and killings of unarmed black men, women, and children, including Michael Brown, Sandra Bland, Eric Garner, Walter Scott, and Tamir Rice, Johani wrote, quote, suppose a client walked into my office and told me that police officers in his country had choked a man to death over a petty crime. Suppose he said police fatally shot another man in the back as he ran away, that they arrested a woman during a traffic shop stop and placed her in jail where she died three days later, that a 12-year-old boy in his country was shot and killed by the police as he played in a park. Suppose he told me that all of those victims were from the same community, a community whose members fear being harmed or killed by police, and that this is true in cities and towns across his nation. At that point, as an immigration lawyer, she wrote, I tell him he had a strong claim for asylum protection under U.S. law. <laughs> as I am sure Professor Stone would have pointed out, this is not the first time that the idea of African Americans as internal or external refugees had been floated or applied. The six million plus African Americans who migrated from the rural south to urban centers during the Great Migration were often referred to as refugees, just as those who were internally displaced by Hurricane Katrina were widely given that label by the news media in the summer of 2005. Incidentally, I didn't really notice people being called refugees when they were evacuating from Harvey. I don't know if that was the demographic. And in Florida, where six million of us evacuated, we were called evacuees, not refugees. <laughs> Having now visited many refugee and displacement camps, the label refugee and this uh, op-ed at first seemed an extreme designation to assign to citizens of one of the richest countries in the world. Still looking back to when I first came to this country, compared to the relative wealth of the rest of the city, could a particularly falling apart Brooklyn public housing project where a childhood friend used to live have been considered a kind of refugee camp, occupying one of the least desirable parts of town and providing only the most basic necessities? Could the nearly neglected public school where we both attended junior high school have been on the edge of Sid refugee camp, a school where there were not enough resources available to keep all the children, including those with special needs and those who were new to the United States, fully engaged in learning. Aside from a few overly devoted teachers, we, black and brown, American and immigrant children alike, 
were treated by those who were in charge of schooling us as though we were members of an intrinsic group. The message we're always getting was that we might be better off someplace else, in another zip code, in a better school district, which is a constant, this type of longing, in the lives of migrants and refugees, including the most recent ones we have been seeing on our television screens, those who have been drowning in the Mediterranean Sea, fleeing environmental disasters, refugees of climates and wars in northern and Saharan Africa and in the Middle East. I have seen state abuses of clothes, both in Haiti, where I was born, during a ruthless dictatorship, and in New York, where I migrated to a working class and predominantly African American and Caribbean neighborhood in Brooklyn at the age of 12. In the Haiti of the 1970s and early 80s, the violence was overly political. Government detractors were dragged out of their homes in prison, tortured, or killed. In New York, the violence seemed a bit subtler. When I started riding the New York City transit buses to the high school I ended up attending three miles from my home, I noticed that a muffled radio message from an annoyed bus driver about someone talking too loud or not having the right fare was all it took for the police to rush in, drag a young man off a bus, and beat him into submission on the sidewalk. There were no cell phone cameras back then to record such abuse, and most of us were too terrified to demand a badge number, which is what you did back then. Besides, many of us had fled our countries as exiles and migrants just to escape this kind of military or police aggression, so we knew how deadly a confrontation with an armed and uniformed authoritarian figure could be. Still, every now and then, a traveler would summon up his or her courage and dodging the swaying baton or screaming from a distance would yell some variation of, stop it, this is a child, a baby. Of course, not all of the police's victims were children. Abner Luima, who is a family friend, was 30 years old when he was mistaken for someone who had punched a police officer outside a Brooklyn nightclub on August 9, 1997, 16 years nearly to the day that Michael Brown was killed. A few weeks ago, on the 20th anniversary of Luima's attack, all these uh, issues came back again, reminding us that how little things had changed. Abner was beaten with fists, as well as with police radios, flashlights, and nightsticks, then was sexually assaulted with a wooden handle of a toilet plunger or a broom inside a New York City precinct bathroom. After Abner, there was Ahmadou Diallo, a Ghanaian immigrant who was hit by 19 of the 41 bullets aimed at him as he retrieved his wallet from his pocket. These are only a few of the cases from that era. I have no doubt that there were many others, including ones involving women of color who were killed by police. A few got attention even then, except for 66-year-old Eleanor Bumpers, who 13 years after Abner's assault was killed by police with a 12-gauge police shotgun inside her own apartment in the Bronx. We marched for them, in the Luima Diallo bumpers decade. We carried signs and chanted, no justice, no peace, and whose streets, our streets, even while fearing that this would never be true. The streets, we worried, were never ours to begin with, just as they hadn't been in the, th in the homelands we were fleeing to obtain safety here. When it was announced that Darren Wilson the Ferguson, Missouri police officer would not be indicted for the killing of Michael Brown, just as Officer Stockley was acquitted for killing Anthony Lamar Smith recently. Back then I kept thinking of Abner Luima, whose assault took place when Michael Brown was just 18 months old. Abner and I have known each other for years. Both our families have attended the same church founded by his uncle. So I called him to hear his thoughts on Michael Brown's killer going free. How does he feel each time he hears that yet another black person was killed or nearly killed by police, I asked him. It reminds me that our lives mean nothing, he replied. We are here in America because our lives meant nothing to the powers that be where we come from. Some of our parents fled prisons, torture chambers, hid, 
than rent for their lives. There are exiles, refugees. Some of us are too. As Professor Shields said, in 2004, my 81-year-old uncle, a survivor of throat cancer who spoke with a voice box, was fleeing a United Nations ambush of his house in Haiti, which led to the death of some young men who tried to kill him, whose friends tried to kill him. He came to Miami, where I lived, and even though he had been coming to the United States for 30 years as a visitor, expressed that he would now have no home to return to in Haiti, and requested temporary asylum at the airport in Miami. He was immediately arrested and detained. His medications were taken away, and he died in the prison ward of a local hospital, chained to his bed five days later. So we are here, many of us, because our lives meant little or nothing where we came from. Then we come to realize that our lives can also mean very little here. Some of us try to distance ourselves from this reality, thinking that if we are the good immigrants, the good refugees, the good blacks, that this is not our problem. That is until we realize the precarious nature of citizenship, which has been made even more precarious with the current leadership of this country. With the president and the attorney general, we have one who thinks that the police are too nice, and that all immigrants are bad hombres and want to denounce white supremacists, and the other, the Attorney General, who praises a eugenics-focused 1924 immigration law that, puts, that even put restriction on Jewish and Italian immigrants back then as being, quote, good for America. Imagine what he must think of the brown ones now. So the precarious nature of our citizenship or our less than attainable citizenship, if we are the 27,000 DACA kids in North Carolina, or the 800,000 around the country who are born here as children, we realize that we too are prey. That those, if those who have been in this country for generations, walking, loving, in the same skin we're in, that if they in some circumstances can have their voting rights questioned and have to keep reaffirming their rights to exist, and that their lives matter, if they could possibly qualify for a refugee status, according to some, then we're all in the same fight, aren't we? Parents are often too nervous to broach difficult subjects with their children. Love, sex, death, race. Sometimes we're forced to have these conversations early, too early. A broken heart might lead to questions we'd rather not answer as might in an appropriate gesture, the death of a loved one or the murder of someone we think of as a stranger. Each time a young black man or woman is killed, either by a police officer or a vigilante civilian, each time a white supremacist marched en masse, I ask myself if the time has come to have the talk with my young daughters about our friend Abner Luima and the long list of non-survivors that have come after him. I certainly don't want my daughters to grow up terrified <coughs> of the country and the world we live in, but is it irresponsible to at least not alert them, as young as they are at 12 and 8, of the potentially life-altering, even life-hending horrors that they might face as young black girls? Even though they were born in the United States and are heir to, along with the first black republic in the Western Hemisphere, the joyous daybreak evoked by Martin Luther King Jr. in his I Have a Dream speech, a kind of double jubilee, they still need the talk. Our daughters, additionally, as the artist Kara Walker calls herself, are also urgently gendered person. So there will also have to be sadly the talk about toxic masculinity and sexual assault. In his own version of the talk, James Baldwin wrote to his nephew James and my dungeon, dungeon shook in his seminal essay in The Fire Next Time, quote, you were born in a society which spelled out with brutal, brutal clarity and in many ways as possible, and in as many ways as possible, that you were a worthless human being. That same letter could have been written to a long roster of dead men and women it's sad to imagine that these young people who have been killed by police or white supremacists, the letters 
what their letters from their loved ones would have said. Would their mother or father, their favorite aunt, uncle, or grandmother, or grandfather have warned them to not walk into white neighborhoods, to impossibly avoid police officers, to never play in a public park, to stay away from neighborhood watchmen, to never go to a neighbor's house and even if in danger, seek help there? Instead of writing love notes, birthday cards, Father's Day wishes, these parents and family members must now issue post-death statements expressing their pain and their loved one's humanity at the same time. I am still in my own mind drafting in my dungeon shook letter to my third culture kids, kids who live between cultures, my daughters Mira and Layla. It often begins like this. Dear Mira and Layla, I've put off writing this letter to you for as long as I can, but I don't think I can put it off any longer. Please know that there will be times when people might be hostile or even violent to you for reasons that have nothing to do with your beauty, your humor, or your grace, but only your history, your race, and the color of your skin. Please don't let this restrict your freedom, break your spirit, or kill your joy. And if possible, do everything you can to change the world so that your generation of brown and black men, women, and children will be the last to experience all of this. And please do live your best lives and achieve your full potential. Love deeply, be joyful, and truly, mom. To my draft of this letter, I often add snippets of Baldwin's letter to his nephew, as well as other works. I tell you this because I love you, and please don't ever forget it. James Baldwin reminded his nephew, also named James, know whence you came. If you know whence you came, there is no limit to where you can go. The world is before you, I want to tell my little girls, and also you today. And you need not take it or leave it as it was when you came in. I want my daughters and all of you tonight to feel that you have the power to at least try to change things, even in a world that resists change with more strength than they have. I want to tell them that they can overcome everything if they are courageous, resilient, and brave. Paradoxically, I also want to tell them, and also you, that as Jane Baldwin said, our crowns have been brought and paid for, and all that we have to do is put it on our heads. But my certainty keeps failing, because every day we wake up, some other group of rights for both US-born Americans and immigrants are being chipped at or taken away. Civil rights, voting rights, educational opportunities, environmental programs, even as we're seeing such visible effects of climate change and three 500-year storms nearly a week apart, Immigration issues, LGBTQIE issues, health care, women's, women's rights, reproductive rights. I want to tell my daughters, just as I want to tell all of you, in the memory of Dr. Stone, that in response, they can now stand by and watch. We must join each other's causes, have each other's backs, form new alliances, tighten old alliances. In Haiti, we have something called combit. In Jamaica, they call it gatia. It's collective work. Basically, today you work my land, tomorrow I work yours. It's, it started, its basis is in farming, where someone has to clear a field and one person cannot do it, and people go around and clear, and clear each other's land. The Haitian, novel, uh, the Haitian novelist Jacques Romain, who was very good friends with uh, Langston News, who translated Jacques Romain's novel, Gouverneur de la Rose into English, Masters of the Duanite, it's a novel I highly recommend, describes Combit as cooperation. And cooperation, he says, is the French, is friendship of the poor. This is also, Combit is like the third principle of, of Kwanzaa, Ujima, collective work and responsibility. So I want to tell my daughters, and I try in ways that will not scare them, to tell them to start practicing Combit and Ujima in some way daily. For some of us, it could be via protest, or sit-ins, or town halls, or volunteering our time and resources. I remind them also that it's important, 
even at their young age. And I would like to remind you too, to study, it's important to study other difficult moments in history, especially African American and African diaspora history. And in that history, we can learn what has worked before. Some things that might seem unprecedented to others seem familiar to people who have continually faced overt and covert oppression in the past. Study that history, as I'm sure Professor Stone would tell you, Dr. Stone would tell you, not just the stony road we trod or the bitter chastening rod. Catch some of, when we look back and wonder, we catch some of the faith that the dark past has taught us. When you study history and the gains people have made against impossible odds, and the Haitian Revolution, for example, and the U.S. Civil Rights Movement, and the dismantling of apartheid, it's much harder for you to despair in the moment. So until victory is won, I would also encourage you to, and I know you've heard all this before, to let your money follow your conscience. Spend your money with people who are not contributing to our destruction politically, economically, and even if with our destruction of our health. Vote and register others to vote. Call up your representatives, tie up those phone lines, run for office if you're really, really brave. <laughs> and if you feel frozen and overwhelmed, just take one small step in that compete, even if in the beginning it feels symbolic. So in the summer of 2015, with Michael Brown and the displacement of Haitian, the Dominican Haitians in mind, I took my daughters, Mira and Leila, to the border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. There they saw and helped comfort men, women, and children who look like them, but are stateless, other types of third culture babies with not even a bed sheet between them and their dirt floor. Young people who may not be killed by bullets, but at that moment by the much slower assault of disease like cholera and other life-threatening illnesses. These are all our causes. I try to tell both to both tell and show them brown and black bodies living with what Franz Fanon called certain uncertainty. Those bodies could have been ours too, I tell them. In fact, they are ours. They are us. We are them. You think your pain and your heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world, James Baldwin wrote. But then you read, or you see, or you weep, or you pray, or you march, or you protest, or you speak, or you write. You raise your voice in some way, you make yourself heard, and you realize, as James Baldwin has said, that the things that torment you are the very things that connect you with all the people who are alive, with all the people who have ever been alive. So you fight so that one day, Everyone will be able to walk this earth as though they, to use Baldwin's words, have a right to be here. You can only rest, I want to say to both my daughters and to you, and I think Professor Stone might agree. You can only rest, and you can only finally claim that crown of yours and put it on your heads when that day of Jubilee finally does come, when the bowed heads of the hungry are finally raised, and when the curved backs of those who have been senselessly made mourners are straightened, when we stop asking, when will this end? When there are more bridges than walls between us, when we can, all of us, walk anywhere on this earth we want, as though we have a total and absolute right to be here. Thank you. <laughs>
leave enough time for those of you who have books and want to have them signed to be able to go outside, uh, right outside here, and have those signed. So uh, I'm going to, I mean, I know how disciplined you are. <laughs> so uh, if you're going to make a comment, you get to make a comment. If you want to ask a question, you get to ask a question. Mm -hmm. Don't get to make a comment and ask me. <laughs> 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 All right. Stand Thank you for being here today. Your timing is kind of perfect with your with your report because we're going to see this incredible refugee situation out of the Caribbean, and it's not even being discussed in the news today. And I just thought you might want to comment about that in the wake of these storms. So, well, this is one of the issues that I was uh, my <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, as I was watching, you know, the, these storms make two stops in some places. For example, when they talk about Barbudura, that small island, and completely evacuating. And now they were talking about Puerto Rico and, and places. And even where I live in Miami, people are, we often realize if these storms hit Miami the way they sit, they would, it would probably be uninhabitable for some time too. So one thing when people talk about the refugee crises uh, as they are in the world, they don't talk about the climate refugees. People who are being driven because by, by weather to, to migrate. And I think we're going to see it, even if it's, what you'll probably have given this administration is they'll probably tighten, you know, they're probably thinking ahead of us, where are these people are gonna to wanna to come here? They'll probably tighten the entries even more. But for people who will be internally displaced within the, you know, the, the territories, I think that, that will be an interesting uh, view of, of migration. And, and you're right that I don't think the, the way climate is affecting migration is, is disgusting enough. We have something like they said we have the most amount of people in motion around the world at this time, something like 65 million people, and half of them are, are minors. So it's something that, that the more we have these, the earthquakes, the, the storms, it's something that we'll be seeing more and more of. And then I think American, like the, I think it's going to affect policies even you know, the immigration policies, certainly, but also the kind of neighbors that we, we will have. Uh, I also, I see, uh, please stand if you will, but I'll mention that this presentation, that, that this presentation is streaming live on Facebook, so the students who are you have to report back tomorrow. But it said it's instantly available, so you can be able to go to the Stone Center's Facebook page and pick it right up. Go right ahead, please. Thanks to the university for bringing you, uh, and, you and thanks to you for your wonderful writing, which I have followed since Breath Eyes Memory. I want to ask, sorry, thank you. <laughs> I want to ask you, Edwig, about cultural myopia that I think is evident with displaced and oppressed people in particular. And I'm speaking to the silos that culturally we get into if you don't live in New York. If you live in New York or somewhere, everybody's mixed up. That's not possible. But, for example, African Americans why isn't the NAACP screaming about DACA or trying to help farm workers? Because guess what? We blacks used to be the farm workers. Why are we, and, and the diaspora, African immigrants from all countries tend to be very clannish and can be very snotty and believe that all African Americans are stupid. I heard you yesterday on NPR mentioning that, that that's, the immigrant's adoption of the majority culture's view of the internally oppressed. But you bridge all these barriers and bring us to life as one human family. 
how can our institutions, how can our cultural endeavors make us realize that we're all the same? Well, I think the, the reality at the moment, and that's why I brought up this issue of the convite, I think it's so much more important for us to have these alliances. In Florida, for example, I'm starting, you're starting to see more younger people, some of them who are in Black Lives Matter groups, or who are together with Dreamers, who are the DACA kids. And, um, and there's, a, there's overlap, of course, in, in that. So that's been encouraging for me to see, where people realize that we're, we're doing this together, or we, you know, we sing separately. And so I, I, I've seen that rapprochement with, with, with some groups, uh, especially younger people's groups. But I think, for example, DACA, uh, people, they're, they're black immigrants who also benefit from DACA, but they're, we, we don't see them in the forefront. You know, we don't, it, it's not talked about. And even when I was writing about DACA, people would say, oh, it's really the Latinos. Um, and, and even if it were, right? But um, there, there's something like, it's a, a hundred thousand, you know, of, of young immigrants uh, from different countries in Africa, from the island, who also benefit from DACA, and even more who could by the time they turn, um, they turn 16. Um, so I, I, I think we have to continue. I think some of the young people are doing it. I see alliances forming on college campuses sometimes that are really powerful. For example, there. Um, where, where I went to college, there were sort of these Kiskeya clubs, where often the Haitian and the Dominican groups, and, and people come together some, in migration, I think, but I think we can do more of that, because together, certainly, that's the notion of the combi, like, like, tomorrow you work my land, tomorrow, and, you know, today you work my land, tomorrow I work yours, and I think we're stronger together, and that's a message that we have to keep saying, especially to young people. There are no, you know, we all have to, you know, these things, especially the way these, these liberties are being chipped away at, we can all be affected um, by, by, by their losses. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> going out the old way, um, uh, Well, I, Farosh, I just finished a short story collection so that, that's on the way, um, and maybe eventually uh, uh, a, a novel. But what I'm doing, what I'm going to be doing soon, and I'm almost afraid to say this the first time I've said it in, in public, is that there's a, a theater in New Jersey that's doing, I'm writing a libretto for an opera about Sarah Vaughan. It's scary because it's actually to write a libretto for someone who it's like to sing, <laughs> also for Sarah, you know, a character playing Sarah Ron. It's pretty daunting, but it's it's another way also that I, I feel like I feel like I'm a to continue to do this work too in a way that you feel like you continue to engage. I feel like I have to infuse myself in different spaces and to have that privilege to do that. I feel like I, I, I look forward to like spending the next year in that in that space with Sarah Vaughan and like, you know I'm already listening to that music night and day. <laughs> okay, uh, right here, right here. interested in you speaking about um, perhaps how your mom has shaped you um, and if there are any kind of values that have made you be the woman you are today. And then my second question is, um, <laughs> <laughs> can you, you said how what shaped me, how my, yeah, how your mom shaped you. My mother? Yeah. Oh. Um, and then the second question is, I'm doing a class about conjure in the African Americas. 
And um, what we were talking at is Allah Hukapati is the king of this world, and obviously you wrote an introduction to that. And I was perhaps interested in your ideas around kind of voodoo and what you think about it. Um, could you kind of talk about magical realism in your introduction and like the power it gives for like it's <laughs> So speak slowly. <laughs> I heard, okay, my mom and then. Uh, it's about this, okay, I'll ask you, so I'm from England, don't I love the accent. <laughs> to resurrect African religions because they never went anywhere. <laughs> right. So in spite of like in the you know persecution by the Catholic Church and other that it's just it's just it's uh it didn't it doesn't go it didn't go anywhere. I don't in the Kabatia book I think there's a little bit of it weaved uh, through our history and often uh, I wouldn't equate necessarily magical realism with voodoo um, because it's just they're two they're they're two separate things. But yeah, I think you know the practice of African religions, including voodoo and Santeria and other and Kandamble and other religions, and other uh, African-based religions. Are, you know, it's a connection certainly to to our origins and and um, and often it's used in literature you know and, and more sort of popular based literature it's reduced to like zombies yeah. right like the over simplification um, so you have all those movies like I walked with a zombie and all these movies that that were based on these U.S. Marines who during the U.S. occupation of Haiti from 1915 to 34, they all wrote their memoirs like Cannibal Cousins or, you know, just like King of Love, you know, just like what they, that was their, they distorted in a way, uh, voodoo, in a way that just was never corrected. But people who are interested in pursuing authentic African religions, you know, you have to seek a little bit for beyond what the, the media portrayals of it are. And I, I'm, I'm always, like, I'm always blown away by sort of people's constant rehashing of, of, of uh, zombie tropes and then their attempts to link it to, to voodoo. It's better if they link it to magical realism <laughs> um, and, and sort of in, the, in, in literary, more literary ways. But with my mother, so um, my new book, which is called The Art of Death, Writing the Final Story, and I know when people hear the title, they always go, oh, you okay? <laughs> um, so it is not my final story. It's just, it's about, uh, so when my mom passed away um, in 2000, about the anniversary actually, it's, it's coming up, she passed away in 2014, I then started, people, when you have a loved one who's sick and who's terminal, who's dying, people start giving you a lot of books. So I got a lot of, you know, I got C.S. Lewis, I got several copies from friends of C.S. Lewis that we've observed. I got a lot of books on death and dying. And then after my mom passed away, I was just, I was just trying, I couldn't start writing. And I just started reading. And so the book is about, it's a weaving in of um, how writers write about death and also with my mom. And my mom, was a very strong presence in my life, but via absence. Because for the for the first 12 years of my life, like a lot of Caribbean people, and I feel like with these storms and, and, and this disturbance, that's something that's also going to be fractured. And that it's not unusual for, for parents, for Caribbean parents, to migrate 
and then you stay with a relative back home. So I stayed. So for the first, I was with my mom for the first four years of my life, and then we got reunited in New York at age 12. So there was this big gap, and I used to, when I was little, you see, I would count my age in two ways. I would count my age in my regular age, and then I would subtract eight years that I was away from my mother, and I would call those my mama age. <laughs> my, so my mother, of course, dying was a very complicated thing for me, which I tried to decipher in, in that book. And also to see in somebody, you know, our parents as immigrant children, you have so much power. And some of you might know what I'm talking about. So you can be like this five-year-old child who goes to the doctor with your mother. You're the interpreter. And they're telling you things that they would never say in front of a child. But you not only have to hear it, you then have to find a way to say it to your parent. You go, you go to, and I, I used to have to go with my mother to the factory when they didn't pay her to ask her boss for her check. And so things like that, I think, also shaped in terms of my interpret. Like, it's just seeing the immigration experience from that thing, which is why I have so much sympathy for the DACA kids and these, these other kids who are this, this really, it's a hard to define position. Of, of being, of parenting your parents through language in such an, at such an early stage in your life. Okay. This will be our last question. I, I'll be brief. Hello. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for your talk. It's deeply moving and inspiring. Sure. Uh, and I, I love this idea of the combi, and I've been deeply inspired by cooperative movements in, in Jackson, Mississippi, for example. I'm just interested in hearing your thoughts on how to sort of extend this cooperative framework across these vast national distances. I mean, we get caught up in these local struggles. It seems like we need a mass movement to resist um, what's, what's coming at us on a daily basis. But how do we reach across these distances um, in this sort of framework of the company? I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, I think people have been using these methods. Imagine we have tools at our disposal now that Generation Past didn't have. You know, you have the internet. <laughs> um, you have, you know, you have social media. You have all these things. I think it's, it, what might be challenging is sort of for people to find, like, where they want to jump in on the wagon. And, and, um, and to decide for themselves, or, you know, sometimes we might have these situations and difficult moments where people are like, well, I'm going to protect whatever little privilege I have left, you know, um, and, and they just don't want to, they, they don't want to just rock their boat and then to try to get on yours. But their tools, I mean, imagine if there were social media doing apartheid, you know, I'm convinced that it would have probably ended sooner, you know. And so they, we have tools now that we never had before. It's just a matter of people finding ways to use them. And then, if they end up being successful, you know, what follows, you know, and, and just what comes next, and how do we not fall back into sort of the complacency that that reach allows us. Because you might feel like, okay, I tweeted about it, I'm done. You know, and I think that also um, leads to a kind of like, okay, people have heard me on the issue. They know I'm not being silent, you know. And so what is the next thing? And, and sometimes that means showing up some places, you know. And, and even if people don't want to be, if, like you don't want to march, like go to a school, talk to some kids, like try to think of ways that, you know, like little things that, that you can do because it just seems like we're in such an, an age that just everything can matter. We're going to meet you outside, but please also don't forget, it's very important for the